Good morning, City Life. Good morning, Church. So grateful that we're all here again. One more week, still blowing my mind. But Lord, the Lord is equally as blowing my mind every week that He's been keeping us and taking care of us. And so grateful to have another Sunday to come and bring the word for us today, to speak, to bring us our word, to preach, uh, all in the efforts of, of fostering this sermon series here on the spiritual gifts of living out spirit-empowered lives. Now, I wanted to start with this story. It has to do with, uh, with our text for today. When Ann and I were dating, I don't even remember when it was when we were dating, but we had this joke about Pocahontas and um, one year for her birthday, I just wanted to buy her a Pocahontas outfit, like a Pocahontas costume. And so I go online and something that was like, I knew she would find it funny um, and it was just an inside joke. And then it gets there on her birthday and she opens it and, <laughs> and she opens this Pocahontas outfit and uh, we, we hear her, she and I both laugh and we take it as a joke. But then I start thinking, okay, wait, hold on. Anne's parents are here. They don't understand the joke. And it looks like their daughter's boyfriend just bought her a skimpy costume. And I just, now I can laugh, but in the moment I was semi-mortified and I was just, oh no, what are they going to think? This, that was purely a joke, no ulterior motives at all, uh, can be perceived as so poorly and maybe even <laughs> without making too much of a stretch. And I just remember being mortified and I remember, I don't even know if Anne's parents remember this, but I remember some of the looks I got on that day and I had just learned a lesson about missing the mark. And I think that's what scripture was, is going to be telling us in today's passage. I think that 1 Corinthians 14 verses 1 to 25 Talk about this lesson, about missing the mark, about trying to be in these spiritual gifts, about learning, about being honest, about being sincere, but missing the mark. And what do we do? How do we re-recuperate? How, how do we have the courage to start living our lives with these spiritual gifts? How do we ask the Lord, Lord, please bring stuff, amazing things out of our community, out of who we are, so that we can live these lives and experience you. And how do we do this honestly without hurting one another? How do we, how do we really look to build one another up? You know, over, over my uh, experience, my life, especially in the last 10 years trying to mature spiritually, uh, a lot of, I've missed the mark on a lot of people. And a lot of people have missed the mark on me. I remember praying with a dear friend and she, she felt like she had a word about my family connection with, with possible drug uh, cartels, possible connection with drug cartels. I'm like, sorry, I don't, I, that's off base. But she went for it and it didn't hit. I also remember being with people who I really trusted, who were over me, who were way more experienced than me. I remember them praying in tongues over me and I would just sit there like this. This is how I felt. I would just sit there going, is anything going to happen? Is there any magic formula? Am I going to be hit with something? And I just remember focus, looking around, fo trying to find what God was doing instead of just being in His presence. And those prayers usually miss the mark. So how do we do this without hurting and abusing one another, without misusing the gifts, but fostering this culture of living Holy Spirit-empowered lives? I believe that God is calling us, City Life, to be a home. It's in our mission statement, right? To find home, and it's for many reasons, but to be a spiritual home for Jersey City, to be a home where people can come and be safe and learn and grow, but also a spiritual home for people to come and experience the gifts, to be prayed over, to find healing, to see that Jesus is real, to experience Him in a new way, that there isn't just the physical, the natural, isn't the only part of life, but that there's so much more, that we are being molded into a home for Jersey City to come and experience healing and restoration in Jesus Christ, to see that Jesus is the way to the Father. 
One of the one of the first things that A. B. Simpson, the founder of the CMA, did back in the late eighteen hundreds was that he formed uh, healing houses, and I believe that's part of our calling at City Life for Jersey City to be this home where people come and find a restoration. People come and, and meet themselves, be in experience as a powerful prayer of powerful words of knowledge that we have, not because of us, but because God gives it to us, and that we can grow and heal Jersey City, and that people will be attracted to this home, not because of us, not because of me, not because of what we might do or our program, but because Jesus is alive and active in our community, and to live out this power, and Holy Spirit-empowered life. Jesus really is supreme over all of this world, and how do we live that out? These spiritual gifts are part of that. We also want to be a church home that helps people heal from church abuse, from people who let them down in the past in the church, from people who misused or abused spiritual gifts in the name of Jesus. And we want to be a church, a community that brings healing to those people as well. The Jersey City is being... <laughs> City Life is being called to be this house for Jersey City and really every church, but especially us. And so let me pray so that we enter into today's word, into 1 Corinthians 14, and to digest a piece of scripture that can be uh, hostile to some. And let's pray that we enter it in unity to see, Lord, what are you teaching us about the spiritual gifts in this chapter, in this portion of Scripture? And how do we apply? How do we use this to build up? And how do we use this to benefit other people and to turn people from being outsiders into insiders? So let me pray, and then we'll hear God's word, and then we'll dive right on in. And so please join me in prayer. Holy Spirit, I thank you for this day, and I thank you for your presence with us. I thank you that you've sustained us every day of our whole lives, but especially in this season, Lord. I pray over this church. I pray over the people listening that we would be of one heart trying to decipher how it is that we live these lives for you to better others, to pursue this agape love that you tell us to be about. And so, Holy Spirit, do the work that only you can do. Come and mold and change our hearts through your word, through your revelation, Lord, and we just pray, Holy Spirit, that you're all over this sermon this morning. And so, Lord, uh, be with us, unite us, knit us together, start, not start, continue to make us into this home that you're calling us to be. Lord, we give you all of the praise and honor. I pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, City Life. My name is AC, and I am here with the scripture reading for today. Our reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 6 to 12. Now, brothers, if I come to you speaking in tongues, how will I benefit you unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or teaching? If even lifeless instruments, such as the flute or the harp, do not give distinct notes, how will anyone know what is played? And if the bugle gives an indistinct sound, who will get ready for battle? So would yourselves... If with your tongue you utter speech that is not intelligible, how will anyone know what is said? For you will be speaking into the air. There are doubtless many different languages in the world, and none is without meaning. But if I do not know the meaning of the language, I will be a foreigner to the speaker, and the speaker a foreigner to me. So with yourselves, since you are eager for manifestations of the Spirit, strive to excel in building up the church. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks, AC, for reading the word for us. Love that you are up here with me. Church, uh, I pray that so far the sermon series on the spiritual gifts has been like nothing that you could have expected. I pray that it's been totally different from when you heard when, I, when we first announced that we were preaching on this topic. I pray that this was um, somehow different than what you thought you had in your mind or the pictures of what you think or think you know about the spiritual gifts. I, I pray that in some really real ways that this sermon series has been so much more attainable, so much more natural, almost as if this is called for us to be living out daily, which scripture continually says that it is. And I hope that that's been the case. You know, this is week five of this sermon series 
on the spiritual gifts and we so far have not really talked or or really digested one of this one of the spiritual gifts so far and it's because of this it's because of this understanding and today's passage really highlights it because it's always about the principle before it is the act because principle always dictates action theology always dictates action theology principles how you understand something will determine how you act in them if I preach from week one about the spiritual gifts and went through each of the ones list and be like, okay, this is how you do this, this is how you do that, this is how we do this, then we would have missed the mark and eventually, eventually we would have either burned out and not seen any of the gifts and we would have been disappointed. Or we might have seen so many of the gifts and that we do what, first, what the Corinthian church did, we start using it as a weapon. We start using it to divide one another. We start using them to say, Oh, I'm special and you are probably not as good as I am at this Jesus thing. And so we've been spending weeks on laying out these principles and we're going to continue that today. And next week we're going to be looking at some of the sp spiritual gifts that are mentioned by name. But let, let's start here this week. Let's start why this chapter is here, why Paul felt it in his spirit from the Holy Spirit to write about this chapter with the first thing is earnestly pursue. To me, I, I, I love this. I, we couldn't skip it, but it's probably by far going to be the shortest section of this day. Verse 1. Can't even leave verse 1 without talking about it. Verse 1 says this, Pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts especially that you may prophesy. And I love this. I love that Paul and his writing, remember, he's writing a letter. The chapters were there for us to study them. And so he's just writing a letter. He's starting from one point and continuing. And so when he's talking about the spiritual gifts, he gets to this point where he's just like, you know what? Pursue love. And that word for love here is the word we've been talking about for weeks. Pursue agape love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. And so we got to start there because there's just even so much goodness in there for us. If as uh, a church who's trying to learn these, practice them, grow in them, be a church, a spiritual home for our city. And this word pursue here, pursue is so nice. It's, I'm, not, I'm not that great at Greek, but I, I, I looked up the pronunciation here. It's diako. And this word sometimes God is in the grammar. Uh, English teachers, I'm sorry, I only said sometimes. But this word here is, in, is a verb. It's in the present active imperative in the second person. And what that really means, that's a, that's a fancy way of saying that this word says this. Do this. Do this when I'm about to say do this. And it's, this word means to run in order to catch. To run after something with all that you have so that you can catch it. So that you can attain it. So that you can have it in your hands and see it and live with it and, and win it almost like a trophy. That the gifts are, are connected to living this agape love life. Remember the self-sacrificing love that cares more about the well-being of God and other people and, and do this because we're told to do this here. He's just off the, out of the gates. He's like, pursue love, run after this love until you catch it. And then he says, earnestly desire the spiritual gifts. And this word earnestly here is zaluo. It's not, not great at Greek, sorry. And this, God is in the grammar. Again, he's, this is a verb. In the present active imperative in the second person. And so the same parsing as the first word, which means do this. Okay, listen, listen. Do this. If you hear this, this is meant for you. Do this thing right now. And this word for earnestly means to burn with seal and to strive after. And I, I, I love that. I love that so much. That the Holy Spirit through Paul is saying, you know what? Strive after this. This is a good thing. This is not a bad thing. It's not a problem if you want to see God move in this life. But sincerely, with all of your heart, with all the zeal, you can muster chase after the spiritual gifts. Not because they're God. Not because you should fall in love with them. But because we're told to. Because it's connected to this agape love. The second the spiritual gifts aren't attached to this agape love. They turn like everything else, fruitless. And so City Life, that, let's, let's start with questions about us first. 
for trying to grow into this community that serves one another, even just within us, but then that goes out, that has outreach, that wants to bring lost people to Christ, who feels like you need to know Christ and we need to tell you about them. We need to, we need to experience these things together. We need to have shared ex- faith experiences and risk, shared risk experiences. How, how are you in your life in our church? How are you earnestly, sincerely pursuing the spiritual gifts? How are you trying to serve the other people in our church? So if we're called to be a family, which we talk about often, if we are this family, how are you serving this family? How are you feeding this body? Is, is there something concrete like that you can point to and say, I do this in our church? And I'm not talking about filling a ministry role. I'm not talking, though, that's good. I'm not talking about how many teams do you lead. Though, that's great. We need leaders. If you want to lead, please come talk to me. Uh, email me. We'll get on a Zoom call. But it's not even just necessarily only that. But it's how, how are you feeding? How are you upbuilding? How are you generating faith in another person in this body that you've been called to? That you say, I want to come to this church because I want to be a member of this community. How are you building us up? And it doesn't just stop at our church. How are you doing this at your job with your coworkers? How are you feeding the faith of other people at your work? People who might not know Christ, people who do know Christ, how are you building them? How are you pursuing their faith? Your family. The holidays are coming up. Thanksgiving, though COVID might be changing that. Sometimes for a lot of people, the holidays are hardest because that means they have to be or are expected to be with their family. Sometimes family is the hardest to minister to. But even in that, how are you living this life that is God, Holy Spirit, empowered, seeking their welfare, their, the best life that they can? How are you pursuing the spiritual gifts for their benefit? How are you doing this agape love thing with your family? How are you doing with your neighbors? How many of us even know our physical neighbors who live on this apartment or the apartment below or above or if you're lucky enough to live in a house, how, are, how many of your neighbors do you know? And I know COVID-19 has really changed that. We moved in this season and it's hard to meet our, mem- our neighbors, but how are we pursuing building them up? And even strangers, how many of us have had genuine faith experiences with strangers? I love meeting strangers and talking to them, having this experience with them. How many times when you meet a stranger are you saying, Lord, is there someone here on this path train for me to talk to? Are you highlighting anyone for you? Have you put someone here and me here for this exact moment? I I love that. And I also hear God saying this to to us in our opening (laughs) segment here that's going longer than I expected it to. I hear God saying to us in here, you know what, it's okay. Please pursue this. It's actually even a command. Pursue the spiritual gifts because they're good. Some of us feel this false sense of humility say, no, I can't desire this. This is too good for me. I wasn't made for this. Or no, or the dreams that I have in my heart, I can't attain because I'm not a pastor. I'm not on staff. I can't do this, Lord. Oh, Lord. Some of us fascinate about praying for people who are sick and having them get, and them being healed. And so God's saying here, okay, pursue it. Dream it. I think the bigger problem for the church here is that we dream too little. How is God saying, dream this. I put this in you. This isn't just you. I made you for this. I made you for prophecy. I made you for tongues. I made you for all of these things. And so go for it. Do it safely, wisely, but do it. Go after it. Church, let's not dream too little. How are we doing this? How are we earnestly pursuing the spiritual gifts and agape love in our life right now? I love how Abraham and Mary both had the same questions when God promised them something big. They both came to this point and said, Is there anything too wonderful for the Lord? And the answer to that is no, there isn't. But we got to move. I wish I could stay here. We got to move on. Our next section here is Here We Go Again Upbuilding and Not Tearing Down. Now, I feel like I need to say this 
Ryan always gets frustrated me with me when I do, and I always mean it, but this time today, I mean it more than I probably have ever meant it before. There is so much here. We are all in this section, in this chapter. We are only scratching, like barely even scratching the surface. Please spend time in chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians this week, because you will benefit from it. And so please, stay, stay in this passage, but we have to pick what we can handle today. We can't do too much. And let's start in verse 6 for this section. Verse 6 says this, Now brothers, if I come to you speaking in tongues, how will I benefit you unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or teaching? And this is really the verse. It's the question that unites this whole chapter. It's what really gives legs to everything we read here in this, what we're reading today. Now, brothers, if I come to you speaking in tongues, how will I benefit you? And I love that question. How will I benefit you? If I don't, unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or teaching. He's saying here, how will I benefit you if I don't give you something that you can take? If I don't give you something that makes sense? If I don't give you something that feeds you where you need to be fed? How will I benefit you? That's the question that Paul, this whole chapter is asking. How will I benefit you? See, I I love the imagery that he uses here a little bit before this. Oh, no, sorry. A little bit after this. In verse 80, he starts talking about a bugle. Anyway, the bugles weren't around then, but we get the imagery. It's really a shofar horn. It's like, how will soldiers know to get ready to fight If Greg is over here not playing the battle song, but playing Mary Had a Little Lamb. So how will you not know, how will you know what to do, how to respond, where to strengthen yourself, where you need help, if I don't give you something that actually speaks to you? And that is so important with the spiritual gifts. It's what really ties them together because the Corinthians here, they have a major problem. If you know anything about the Corinthians, they had many major problems. But this was one of them, and this was something so significant in the life of their church. You see that in their community there had been this problem coming up about prophecy in tongues. And so let's, let's, this is actually the first time we actually concretely look at some of the gifts, some of the gifts that are stated here. And so let's start talking about tongues, because to understand what's going on here, to answer this question, how will I benefit you? Paul starts talking to this specific church about tongues and prophecy. And so let's start with tongues, because that's where we need to start. First, let's affirm that tongues are a good thing, something that God made and gave to the church to equip it to encourage itself. See, in in verse 18, Paul says here, a humble brag. You know how humble Paul is. We all know how humble he is. Verse 18, he says, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Okay, humble brag. Paul is the world champion at tongues, and so it's a good thing. Him and his soul, he so loved the gift of tongues that he thanked God for it publicly. He's like, Lord, thank you so much. This is such a good thing. I have never prayed in tongues, and if God gives it to me, I'm sure I would love it too. But Paul is like, man, like oh, I love this one. This is so good, and so it's a good thing. So the people who say tongues are evil, that's not true. Scripture doesn't back that up, but let's look at this. The gift, let's, let me read you some definitions so we know concretely what to do with this. This is one definition that I like. The gift of tongues is simply the spirit-energized ability to pray, worship, give thanks, or speak in a language that is other than your own or one that you might have learned in school. The tongues is this, you just are empowered to pray in this way that it doesn't come from your knowledge. You shouldn't know what you're saying, but somehow you do. You're connecting with the Holy Spirit in this way, and you're praising and glorifying God. So it's a beautiful thing. Another thing that I read here, it's also important that we keep our sense of perspective. Tongues are neither God's greatest gift to his most holy favored children, nor the devil's most sinister tool of deceit. Tongues are just like any other gift of the Spirit. It's not a sign of God's special love. It's not a sign of heightened maturity in Christ. It is only as good as it reflects the teachings of the Holy Scripture. 
So praying in tongues is a great thing. It's a good thing. But here, Paul is teaching this church what this is looks like. Because, you know, tongues is such an outwardly facing, even though everything about tongues except for one scenario, everything about tongues is supposed to be for the inward, its inward perspective of that person praying it. It's to give God glory and it's to, and it's to encourage the person praying it. Only in one circumstance do we see, even here that he talks about, when there's interpretation of that tongue, is it meant for the crowd? It's, all, it's usually always meant for the God to speak to a person. And I hear it's powerful. Again, I've never been in it. But, but Paul here is saying, you know what? Tongues is good, but it's really meant for you most of the time. It's meant for you and it's meant for God. And he starts, he starts putting this emphasis on prophecy. And see, this, this is a definition of prophecy that I like. A prophetic word seems so often to come at just the right time in a person's life. At the moment where, when there is a need to know that God is near, that He cares, that He still loves and guides and answers prayer. A simple definition would be that prophecy is the human report of a divine revelation. Prophecy is the speaking forth in merely human words of something God has spontaneously brought to mind. I love that. Verse 3 here gives us some insight too. And there are three purposes for prophecies. It's for the, it's for upbuilding, the upbuilding of someone. It's for encouragement and it's for consolation. And so this is a really outward focus. It's, not real, it's never all about the person. It's never about just one person. It's not feeding your insides. It's not encouraging your own faith, but it's for someone else. And so in my own words, I feel like prophecy is this. Prophecy is when God deems something important enough to give you special revelation for it. Where God's like, oh, no, you need to know this. I'm going to give this to you right now. You need to be able to pray for this. Tell your church about this. Tell the stranger about Do this. You're supposed to know this right now, and he gives it to us at the right time, and it's supposed to edify and bring up and console people. It's, it's this thing, I shouldn't know this, but now I do, and I have to respond to it. And so here's the problem. Here's the dilemma that the Corinthian church is going through. This is why Paul writes this, and this has everything to do with the question that we just asked. Verse 6, how will I benefit you unless I bring you some revelation? And this is the problem. When we stop concerning ourselves with others, when we let the spiritual gifts point to us instead of the Lord, point to us instead of other people, when we stop asking ourselves, how will this benefit you? How? And then we stop earnestly pursuing something. We start asking, how, how can I look good? How can I make myself stand out? How am I special? And so, like I said, tongues in Scripture are almost always meant for the inward person. If God gave me tongues to speak right now, I would probably sit here in silence and let that encouragement wash over me as I praise the Lord. If He gives me interpretation with other people, then we're going to rock with it. We're going to go with it. What is God saying to us? I got my call to ministry through interpreting tongues. But the issue here with the Corinthian church was that, that, these, that the Corinthians were saying, okay, what's special about me? What will benefit me? What will encourage my status here? See, let, let's read verses 18 and 19 here. It says, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Again, humble brag. But in 19, he says this, Nevertheless, in church, I would rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct others, ten, then 10,000 words in a tongue. And you see here, God's not bashing something that he created and called good. Tongues is not the enemy here. It's not evil, but it's our intention. It's when the Corinthian church started to say, how can this serve me and not you? How can this praise me and not the Lord? And then we lose it. We lose the meaning of the gifts. We lose the value of it. And like Paul says here, becomes like everything else that we do apart from God, unfruitful, unintelligible, does nothing. It brings no life. 
I also love how Paul connects with this passage, connects with the spiritual gifts, this pursue agape love. Because the central being of agape love is that you so love the Lord that you go out and serve others. And, and this is the whole in our thinking. If I'm worried about him, who's going to worry about me? If I'm worried about them and, and give something of myself to them, who's going to worry about me? But that's, the cent- that's what's central to God's agape economy. Is that if I'm out here worrying about you, serving you, doing this, there's someone over here who's doing it for me. And then there's someone else doing it for them. And there's someone else doing it for them. And in, in this body, in this church, that's what we're called to, to serve one another on and on and on. And there'll never be a hole because when I'm worried about someone, someone's worried about me, then someone's worried about them and someone's worried about them. These spiritual gifts are given to us for us to benefit one another, to go out and say, you know what, agape love causes me to do this for you. And it's usually only even praying or speaking, but you know, sometimes it's giving, sometimes it's sacrificing, and I'm doing all of these things. But you know what, someone's coming here to do it to me. So don't worry about when we're going to lack. Don't worry about when we're missing, because you know what, God is going to cause someone else to come and serve us. And so when we stop asking the question, how can I benefit you and start saying, Lord, how is this going to feed me? How is this going to benefit me? How am I going to be built up? We're losing the point. We're losing the point of the spiritual gifts. Here, God, so many people want to bash tongues, say that it's the worst. You know, God made it, and he made it to be a special thing. So it's not about that. But he's saying, you know what, prophecy? It's when you want to go and speak it for other people. It's when you want to feed the whole body. And so go out and do it. You know why? Because everyone is getting edified. Everyone is being built up. City Life, we need to be a church that's prophesying. Here, this is the only command of any of the spiritual gifts. Paul's saying here, you know what? I command you to go after prophecy. You know Because that's what the church does. It feeds and upholds and encourages and consoles one another by getting knowledge that we might not know on our own without the Holy Spirit and do it for everyone else because everyone else is also going to be doing it for you. And so we're, everyone is building one another up. And so church, in, in this section, even before we even leave, let's ask the question that Paul is at begging us to ask today. How will I benefit you unless I bring you something that you can use? Revelation or knowledge or prophecy or teaching. How am I just going to live this life without giving you something that you can actually use that will benefit you? Church, if we as a church, if any group of Christians stop asking this question, the same thing will happen to us as it did the Corinthian church. The spiritual gifts will not be gifts anymore. They'll not be life-giving, but they'll be weapons used to divide us, to say, I'm better than you. I'm going to serve myself over you. And this is what happened in this church. This is what Paul was saying. Do not do this. Correct this in your body. Ask yourselves this question. How will I benefit you unless I bring something that you can use? I I love that. I wish we could stay here. But Paul goes on. He talks about what the purpose of all of this is for and, and what I've been calling outsiders into insiders. Let's read two verses here, starting in verse 16. Otherwise, if you give thanks with your spirit, how can anyone in the position of an outsider say amen to your thanksgiving when he does not know what you are saying? What he's saying here, the word amen means I agree, right? When we say amen, when we finish a a prayer and we all say amen, we're really saying, I agree, I affirm what you just said, and I'm going to live towards that. And so here Paul is saying, you know what, if you're speaking, if you're trying to give something to people, if you're missing the mark like my story from the beginning, if you're also just misusing the gifts, how can anyone say amen and join in your thanksgiving when they don't know what you're saying? I I love how Paul puts this in. He's like, you know what, these gifts are also like meant to bring people from the outside in. That, it, that prophecy gives someone who is on the outside knowledge, insight. They see that God is able to break through anything and that draws them in. You know, if, I, if God gives me a word about love for a stranger and I go up and say, you know what, God loves you, you are not forgiven. That's bringing them in. And hopefully enough people are doing that. Or I enter into a relationship with that person. Or they start coming to our church and we draw them in. 
that we let the word, we let God expose them to who they really are, and then they come from being outsiders and they start being insiders. We, he also picks this back up in verse 23. If therefore the whole church comes together and all speaks in tongues, and outsiders or unbelievers enter, will they not say that you are out of your minds? But if all prophesy and an unbeliever or outsider enters, he is convicted by all, he is called to account by all. The secrets of his heart are disclosed, and so, falling on his face, you will worship God and declare that God is really among you. Now that might be really, really intimidating for some, but let's focus on what he's really saying here. You know, he's not saying tongues are horrible, but he's saying, you know, if we are giving someone something that won't feed them, that was really meant to feed us, if we stop asking the questions, how am I serving you and not just myself, and we actually start to give him something that he needs, something will happen. That if we just pray in tongues, okay, they won't get it, and they'll rightfully say, you guys are crazy, this is weird, I'm out of here, and I think most of the time rightfully so. But if we start giving him, if we start asking the question. What can I give you that will benefit you? And you know what will happen? They'll come and they'll hear the truth. As believers or as outsiders, they'll be convicted by everything they've done. If we know something that we shouldn't know, if we allow God to move powerfully or, or have a prayer for healing or something like that, you know what? They will be exposed to themselves. Their hearts will be disclosed. Falling on their face, they'll repent and they'll worship the Lord. And so I love that. I love that that is what Paul is, keeps telling us about the spiritual gifts. It's not meant for you. It's not meant for power. It's not meant for display. It's not meant for how good you are. It's not a sign that you are this perfect Christian. No, no, it's actually none of that. It's always to give God praise. And it's always to bring people closer to him. For those who believe, it's about strengthening and building up their faith. I'm pretty sure most of you by now will sign a petition asking me to stop saying the word build up or up building or, or any of those combinations. But that's what this is all about. It's to give people something that will benefit them. And so church, I, I really don't know what else to say in this section here. But that it's, it's, our, it's our calling, our pleasure, and our duty to be a church that goes to Jersey City a church that invites people in, not only to our church, but into God's body and say, you know what, Look, this is what the Lord wants to say to you. This is what the Lord can do. Oh, we're this community that actually loves each other. We're this community that looks out for the betterment of everyone else instead of ourselves. We're this church that takes this seriously. We're a church that believes that Jesus is supreme. We're a church that really believes that God is calling us to sacrifice for one another. And then we start doing these things, and, and that'll attract people. We started today by talking about this home, the healing homes that A.B. Simpson built. And that's where, that's where we want to close. That's, that's where I, want, I feel God telling us to close it, that God is molding us to be this, these healing homes. And not just physical healing, but yeah, that's a part of it too. Pray for healings. That's a spiritual gift. But these homes that like are so focused on healing, on benefiting one another, on drawing each other, of exhorting each other, go in, go in more, hold on to Jesus. Jesus, have something incredible. Let's go. I'm going to pray for you until this happens. I'm going to pray in faith, asking for a miracle for this to happen, and on and on and on. And when I'm focused on someone else, someone will be praying for me, whether I know it or not. And we are this church body that are, is feeding itself all the time. A, a church that has big dreams because we know God can do big things in this city no matter how big it is. And so church, this, this is our conclusion for the day. It's not even its own section. It kind of just is getting absorbed into this right now. How are we going to be this church body that says, you know what, Jesus, make us into these people who are so concerned with bringing you glory and serving one another that we see in miraculous things, miracles happen, that we are part of praying healing over people, that we are part of having this great administration, which is one of the weirder listed spiritual gifts, or how we can acts of mercy and give financially to this and to that, and how we are a church that always has enough money for causes, because not because we're the richest, but because 
it's important to us how do we become this church that is becoming more and more like these healing homes that I think our church is called to be, that I know city life is being called to be? How do we, how do we say, Lord, make us look into this? Part of it is the spiritual gifts. And part of it is pursuing agape love. And so church, how do we become this church that is so concerned with addressing and asking the question, how can we give you something that will benefit you how can these spiritual gifts be something in our community that's vibrant and alive and it adds dimension and it adds complexity in a good way and it adds activity that we are a church body that is alive and active and seeing incredible things happening in every season of our history. How can we benefit one another? How can the spiritual gifts come and, and bring life, the life that God had meant it to be? And how do we properly use the gifts? That's our assignment going forward. How are we going to be able to be this community that does this and does this right, always looking out for the betterment of God, for praising God and looking out to better one another? And so we have these prompt questions. Let me read them. And as you're discussing, keep asking yourself that question. How can I give you something that will benefit you? How can I give you something that you can use to take and to grow and to love God more today than you did the other than you did before you came on this call? So church, we love you. Can't wait for us to be together again. We're getting news out there. We're looking at the COVID rates and seeing if we can meet again in person before it gets too cold. But we love you. Keep you in our prayers. Join me on our prayer calls. Oh, and also one thing. I want to encourage people, if you have any questions about the spiritual gifts as we're looking to wrap up this sermon series, I know that there will be a multitude of questions that I would not even have started to address because this was our first step into addressing all of these things as we are preparing for the Advent season coming up. Send me any questions you have of the spiritual gifts. Send them to uh, preese at citylifenj.com. And I'll be looking at those. I'll see which ones I can answer, how we can get creative in answering your questions about the spiritual gifts. Because honestly, if we could spend years on this subject matter and still only scratch the surface. But I really want to hear about the questions that you really like, Pedro. I really want you to answer these. It might make it into one of our next sermons. And so send me that email, prees at citylifenj.com. I'm eagerly awaiting to see if there are any great questions out there. Um, because I, I want us to keep growing and understanding what these are so that we can feed our church family and get people to know Christ like we have never in our history. And so here are our prompt questions. Prompt question number one. What are you earnestly pursuing for others in city life? What's the mark that you're leaving in this church? What spiritual gift are you saying, Lord, I, I want to be able to do this for our church? And let's discuss that. Prompt question number two. What has been your understanding of prophecy or tongues? How does today affirm or challenge your understanding? I know we all have these conceptions and misconceptions or things that we thought were true and maybe it looks, looks like it is true. Uh, what were those that you brought into today? We only scratched the surface of these two gifts, but how, how do you come out of today feeling about prophecy or tongues? Prompt question number three. How can we practice spiritual gifts with outsiders or unbelievers? How as a church can we do this and get creative and build safe environments for people who would not go to a church? How do we do that even in a pandemic, but beyond the pandemic as well? Church, we love you so much. Can't wait for us to be together. We'll see you very soon. Join me on my prayer call. Join me on the prayer calls. Monday, Tuesday, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and I'll see you soon. Love you so much. Have a good one.